Welcome to the Greg Bennett Show presented by Any Question. I'm your host, Greg Bennett. And this conversation was special with high performance coach, mental coach, or as he likes to call it, action coach, Seth Pepper, who works with some of the greatest athletes in the world and um, business people and artists and everybody else in between and just helping them optimize their lives through the power of the mind. It's a topic that obviously I love and, and you've probably heard me talk about it often on many of the shows, mental strategies on, on how we can better handle our lives and get the most out of our potential. But this one was just absolutely fantastic. I'm going to have to have him back on again because we went for about an hour 15. It was all gold. There was so much great information in this one. I think you'll thoroughly enjoy it. I hope you do because I truly did. Now, a little bit of housekeeping before we go on. First and foremost, I do want to just thank you so much for listening and sharing the show. I truly appreciate all the feedback that you provide as well. It really means the world to me. I also want you to go check out any question. Um, that's any question, one word. You can download on your iOS or Android. And you can actually use right now a promo code that will give you a free till October 27th. And that promo code is TRI2022. So T R I 2022. Um, and put that in and when you sign up you won't need to have your credit card or anything else and you can then go on there and ask some of the world's greatest experts questions you can listen to a whole plethora of answers in there there's a new search feature that you can search whether it's uh, nutrition or sleep or mental strategies or anything else we've got some of the world's greatest experts on there answering questions so go check it out that's any question i hope you enjoy, enjoy this one as much as i did it was really fantastic and until next time remember Success comes to those who endure just one moment longer. All right, my guest today has developed mental training systems that have helped Olympians, world champions, Netflix film directors, and executives optimize their potential. He's seen firsthand the results, the power of the mind, and what it can deliver, both the good and the bad. It's an honor and privilege to have him join me today to discuss a favorite topic of mind, and that's mental performance. So welcome, and thank you for joining me on The Greg Bennett Show, High Performance Coach, Seth Pepper. How are you, mate? I'm doing amazing. Really looking forward to today. Yeah, me too, mate. Uh, we, um, we were just introduced uh, just over a month ago from a mutual friend, uh, Dr. Luke Bennett, no relation. And, and Luke's been on the show himself. He was actually one of the first 10 episodes, I think, back in early 2020. And, and Luke's background, just for people who don't remember, he uh, works with a company called Hints of Performance, uh, and he's the head of director of sport and, and medicine there. And they look after all the Formula One drivers and, and, and teams and everything with, with, you know, mental performance coaches and physiologists and everybody else. And I think you've done some work with those guys. So it was great to have this connection. I, yeah, it's been fun to be able to connect with you. And I have the greatest respect for Hinsa and all the work that they're doing with all the Formula One drivers. I think that they're currently working with 96% of all of the podium winners. So <laughs> they are doing well. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I, Luke's told me that many times that they've got a pretty, you know, they're obviously, they're you know, done, doing a lot of work with Mercedes and McLaren and, and, and numerous drivers and teams, but they're exceptional because they do understand the whole, the holistic approach and well-being to high performance, which I think we're all learning you know, the potential within that. But one of the pillars that they really lean on is mental strategies. And it's an area that honestly, it's one of my favorite conversations I have in this show, um, whether we're talking visualization, affirmations, uh, the way we should react to certain things that happen to us, you know, the, the physical and emotional stresses and all of those kinds of things and, and just how adaptable and resilient we can be if we have the right tools. So I really want to dive into all of that with you. Uh, I really want to sort of discuss, you know, your methods and your results and everything else. But before we do that, how about we rewind the clock and if you can give us a bit of an understanding of your journey, your story, and how you came to be sort of a high performance, you know, mental coach. Sure. Yeah. I would love to. Okay. So this is not a movie. This is real life. <laughs> 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 I started with a curiosity. I grew up in a family. It goes counter to what maybe the majority might expect a performer to come from in the athletic field. My dad built classical guitars. My mom was an English teacher, a writer. And so I grew up around the arts. Mm. I didn't grow up in a sports environment. So I still remember watching Miracle on Ice when the 
1980 Olympics happened and I was hooked, I, you know, fell in love with, you know, what, what is the Olympic experience? And from there, it was just a seed that was planted. But again, my environment wasn't really encouraging me to go after it. And then when I was 14, that's kind of the age where you start to kind of realize, okay, I got to go do something with my life. And it's my, my destiny to go make it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so from that point of curiosity, I've always been really spreadsheet based, right? I get a spreadsheet out, <laughs> I make a list, and then, you know, basically navigate whatever it is that I'm interested in when I'm studying. So my journey really is a journey of, I like to call now a mental experiment. Mm. And so I started watching the 84 Olympics and with the Olympics, I was trying to figure out, okay, I, I'm running out of time. 14 is really <laughs> old for any sport. <laughs> so I have to choose a sport. And I also grew up in this tiny little town up in Oregon, and I needed to find a sport that I could actually get access to. Hmm. That was it. So I had the spreadsheet out, watched all the different sports, marking them off the list. And then I really narrowed it down to swimming. And once I focused on just swimming, then all I did was just listen and watch for clues. You know, that's what I'm always talking mm -hmm. about is like little breadcrumbs. And there was a girl that won the gold medal, Madam Butterfly. And she was also a world record holder. And the announcer asked the question that was actually in my head, which was, if there's someone out there that wants to do what you just did, what would you suggest? And I remember, I believe in, you know, things, just kind of the timing of things. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, Whatever she says, that's when I'm going to, I'm going to do that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And you're 14. I love it. 14, yeah. 14. And she said, I went through a YMCA. So that's a youth athletic club. They have them throughout the United States, at least. Mm -hmm. And in my tiny, tiny little town, you know, they had a YMCA as well. So back then ran to the yellow pages, found you know, the listing. <laughs> you, you, you're dating <laughs> yourself, mate. I tell you what, I love I, it. I know, I got to <laughs> Go on, I'm sorry to interrupt. Our kick. Yeah. yeah. I go and, and look up where it is, go down there, tiny little pool, right? If for anyone that knows size of pools, it was a 20 yard pool, two lanes in the basement of this building. Walk up to the head coach and I say, my name is Seth Pepper and I want to go to the Olympics. Can you help me? And he, he said, okay, um, do you know how to swim? And I said, no. <laughs> and so he laughed at first and he knew that I was sincere and he sent me over with the eight year olds. So <laughs> I'm now with little tiny kids and they know how to swim. I don't know how to swim. But I always tell that, that story because I think it's really important that people know I was clear in my mind of what I wanted to do. I didn't say I am going to the Olympics. That would have been, you know, perceived mm. as cocky or arrogant or completely deluded. But I was curious, mm. right? And I was speaking clearly. And I've heard, Greg, I've heard you say this before in your podcasting. I've done a little bit of mm. research on you as well. And I've heard you speak things into existence, mm -hmm. right? I want to, and I won't say his name, but he's one of the top um, podcasters in the world mm. right now. Mm. And I said, he's doing the same thing I was doing, right? Mm -hmm. Just put it out there, you know, be vulnerable, yeah. right? Be clear. And that's exactly what I did. And so I started training with these eight-year-olds, learning how to swim, kicking my butt all over the place. Um, first meet I went to, I had to stop halfway through because I had basically drank half the pool, right? <laughs> very, it. very humble, humble beginnings. Mm. About the same time, my dad, even though he wasn't an athlete, he was loving and supportive in his way. And he was always interested in self-development. So I grew up mm. with all these Dale Carnegie books, all kinds of like self-improvement books. And he had this book on, it was on memory actually. And he said, in this book, there's a few pages and it's on this uh, well-known study at the time, the East Germans. And what they had done is they had three test groups and they were testing them in basketball, um, shooting free throws. One group, all they did was physical training. That was it. Hmm. 
next group was mental training and physical. Mm. And that was the first time where I was like, what? You can train your mind? I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> I was just working on my body. Mm. <laughs> that started opening the doorway. And then there was another group that all they did was mental training and they didn't even touch a basketball. Test results come back and they, the group that all they did was physical, lowest score mm. by far. The top group, it was the mixed group. And then this group that didn't even touch a basketball was just slightly below the top group, which just immediately I was like, that's it. That's what I've been looking for. Cause I'm always looking for those clues. Remember? Mm. And that, that was my next, that was the thing that was going to get me from A to B. And how old you, were you still 14 or is this a bit later? Yeah, this, this yeah. was early. Yeah. That's wow. why I think, yeah. um, you know, it's kind of all put together really nicely because I started with this idea of, I want to build something from the very beginning. And immediately I was training my mind and my body. Mm. It's not something that I brought in supplementary later on. Mm. That was really a distinguishing part of my journey. And so right away, I just got curious, like, what is this mental thing? How do I train my mind? And then I you know, started just uh, studying the power of the subconscious mind. Mm. Back then, people weren't really talking about vision boards and things like that as, as much as they are now. So it was really pretty clinical for me, at least. And what I, I did was I went and I took a Sports Illustrated. There was an Olympic edition and it had this swimmer in it well-known swimmer, Pablo Morales. Mm -hmm. And I cut out his picture and I put it on my wall. And then I took a picture of myself and I put it on the wall and I made it so that they were touching each other, right? So that his world and my world were coming together. Mm -hmm. And it was just this visual cue that would trigger. It was like putting a post-it note on the wall saying, hey, think about this Mm -hmm. as often as you can. Think about it, think about it. And it was what I like to call now normalizing this, this greatness or normalizing this future. I went about my business and eventually, you know, through training both my mind and my body equally within four years, I became a state champion Mm. in Oregon. So that's pretty, pretty good for, you know, just learning how, um, and swimming with those little eight year olds. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I love it. Keep going. I, I love how you've, at a young age, you understood the power of the mind. I think this is fantastic. Yeah. And, I, and also there's a part of the story that I think is helpful because you and I have kind of started to talk about youth athletics and specialization. Mm. My dad treated my sport as a hobby. He wasn't familiar with sports, so we didn't have a lot of money. So he said, you can do it. I'll sign the release forms, but you're going to have to pay for it right? Mm. And also you're going to have to get yourself to workouts and you're going to have to get yourself to the meets, right? That. Just find the, a way. The ownership of that is just so empowering. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And the way I'm, I'm wired, I'm not saying this works for everyone, but the way I am wired, you know, it, even if he asked me, how did it go? That was like, Hey, ease up on the pressure, you know, <laughs> give me some, <laughs> give me some space. Here. Well, well, I can't breathe. Uh, I, was, I can't breathe. <laughs> How'd it go? Uh. <laughs> what I started to do was I had to ride my bike 10 miles to be able to get to work out. And what that did was, you know, once you get there, you're going to make sure that that workout was really going to go well because you've already invested a lot just to get there. Mm. So eventually this paid off when I was in college and we would do kick sets and I was never beat ever, Mm. whether it was, you know, short sprints or it was long distance going against, and I'm a sprinter. So, Mm. you know, my race was like 20 seconds long, but I could compete long distances with the distance swimmers, you know, as far as kick sets. Mm. So really that, you know, the whole stoicism of it, your obstacle becomes your way. Mm -hmm. All of these things that are blocking my way, became a blessing in disguise. It's like that whole expression of anti-fragile that's become a bit commonplace these days is, you know, what it's like, it's, yeah. it's actually made you stronger. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And that, that's why whenever I'm working with someone, I always try to reinforce that everything serves us moving forward. Mm-hmm. I say it over and over. It may not make sense right now, mm. but this is going to be a blessing. Mm-hmm. It will eventually. Mm. So let's lean into it and it will dissolve Mm -hmm. and you'll get a lesson from it. Back to the story of the trajectory was now I'm looking at universities 
again, because I had started at such a late age, I had experienced failure without even knowing it as failure. To me, it was just processing information. It actually looked like a disadvantage at the time, but it has become a huge advantage in being an athlete, but also in working with people and really encouraging them to lean into failure and take away the stigma of the failure, right? Because it, I was just basically thrust into the deep end of this experience going, well, if you take this personal, you're not going to keep doing this for very long. Mm. So you just got to absorb it quickly and learn as many lessons as you can in the shortest amount of time. Looking at universities, I wanted to do the same. So I reached out again, got the spreadsheet out and I took the top 20 schools. I contacted all of them and I put together a little press packet cover sheet, you know, with a mission statement, basically describing this is what I've done in this amount of time. If you give me a chance, watch out. Mm. Okay. And so that's what I still do. I help people write, if you will, a mission statement because I believe what your thoughts become your words, Mm -hmm. become your actions, Mm -hmm. right? So whenever I get a chance to tell this trajectory of a story, I'm really trying to tell you these story points to be able to say, I not only performed at a high level, but I was speaking it first, right? Mm -hmm. I was being vulnerable and I was just putting it out in the world. So if that first coach laughed at me to the point where he wouldn't let me continue, I would have gone and told my story to someone else until someone gave me access, <laughs> right? Because I was clear in my mind. Mm. So the same thing, same process when I went to the universities and I contacted all 20 and I got a good response, visited a lot of different places. But in the United States, the Pacific Conference, I would say majority of all the Olympians were coming out at that time, mm-hmm. were coming out of the Pacific Conference. And so that's kind of where I wanted to be because I was always curious, like, what's the, what's the rest of the world doing? Because if I can get access to that, then I know where I stand, mm-hmm. right? I used to cut out times, you know, that you, in the back of, for us, the, you know, the, the Sports Illustrated for swimming back then was swimmer, swimming world, mm-hmm. swimmer's world, swimming world. And so I would cut out these times and I'd post them, you know, back in my small little club saying, this is what the rest of the world's doing. You know, you got to think I global, not local. <laughs> I used to do that with the triathlete magazines, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. And you look at their times and everything else and be like, okay, one day, one day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so that one day was starting to happen that University of Arizona was interested in. They had me come out. They had a brand new coach. And what I was looking for in a coach, ironically, I really wasn't looking for credentials. And it's a good thing because no one knew about this coach. He had just been hired. I was looking for someone that reminded me of my father. Okay. My dad may have not been an athlete, but he really encouraged me to dream. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. he was really, and that, I think that was kind of actually better that he just accepted me unconditionally mm-hmm. and said, yeah. Yeah, you want to go to the Olympics? Sure, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's not that's not an easy thing to do, by the way. It, you know, when you think when you're not the one in that person's shoes, and you can be judging, and you can be thinking, "Oh, this person's delusional" or whatever else, to actually put away your own ideas of what someone can become and just be like supportive. It's not, it's not that easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Now as a parent, yeah, yeah. Yeah. To be, to have the roles switch. Exactly. It is interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've had some, you know, my parents are really unique in that way. Yeah. They've just given me, which I think is really critical. And I'll touch on this a little bit later. Um, space. Mm. Like really, that was it. That was the blessing that I got was just this space to explore, Mm. right? Mm. That was critical for me to be able to figure it out myself and then just have that unconditional support. And so that's what I saw in this coach. His name's Frank Bush. And I found that father in, in the next level of performance. And I trusted him because I trusted him with my ideas. That was it. That's all I cared. Because you really wouldn't know much about him. He, he hadn't done much at the time. He had kind of thrown his hat in the ring. And it was one of those strange destiny stories where he was actually going to retire from swim coaching. And he was just, this was a last ditch effort. And this was probably one of the more sought after jobs. 
But the university at the time allowed the student athletes to be able to have equal say in who they hired. Mm. I don't know if that's happened since, <laughs> mm. but it was key for this because everyone chose Frank. He became our coach. So from that point forward, you know, his trajectory has been interesting because we eventually, the program became a dynasty program. Both men and women won the national title. He went on to be the head Olympic coach. He went on to be in charge of USA Swimming. Wow. So he was more or less in charge of Michael Phelps' five Olympics. Mm. And here's a guy that was going to qu quit and become a realtor, real <laughs> estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story in itself, isn't it? Just somebody that just found their passion, was able to go all in and, and have the support yep. from those around him. That's a great story. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, he just had that personality where you felt like you could trust him. Just lean on that one moment longer, the the, the trust side, because you, you mentioned that and, and that he was a bit like your father. Was it something he said or was it a way that he behaved? W what was it that you felt, you know, as you're interviewing potentially the school that you're going to go to and have him be your coach? What was, uh, can you remember what was sort of the standout features that he had that gave you that trust? I think I was just looking for someone that, was a good listener would probably be one of the first, mm -hmm. right? That, mm -hmm. that he just gave me that space. Mm. I mean, you wouldn't be surprised, but maybe there are people out there that would be surprised that I call it the crabs in the bucket. It's this whole idea principle that you can put a bunch of crabs in a bucket and you don't have to put a top on it because as soon as one crab starts to crawl out, almost get out, the rest of them pull it back, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of that limiting mindset. And you see that play out, and especially in social media, mm. these limiting mindsets are able to spread what I would call poison. That's how they see the world, and they don't want you to actually believe in your dreams and go after your dreams. Mm. Right? Mm. And so that's what I found in these you know, pivotal relationships with these people was space and just belief, right? Mm. Where they, they would allow me to say, I mean, it was crazy that I would want to say, even say that I wanted to go to the Olympics at the age of 14 and then to go to my head coach and say, I want to be top 16 as a freshman. I want to be a national champion. And he'd just listen patiently and go, yeah, okay, hmm. let's do it. You know, and you'd think that would be common, but I actually had coaches saying, well, don't you think that's a little fast? And I would go, you can't say that to me. Like, that's not what a coach says, no. <laughs> <laughs> let me go. Let me go. I mean, on that, I, and, and I'm, I know I'm cutting into your storyline here, but I just want to, before we go too far, I keep going back to when you were 14 and that there's a boldness that you had to some degree, a confidence. A lot of people, especially at that age, uh, it's an age where, and I've, won, I've spoken about on this show, you know, I, I had my insecurities and, and I, I kind of felt... I wasn't that kind of person at 14 that, that, that would go up to somebody and say, I'm going, I want to be an Olympian or I, I was very, it took me a long time to develop that confidence, that boldness, that courage. Was that in you or was that work? Was that something you had to work out? Well, that, that's a really good question because what appears to be courage is actually just the ability or the openness to look foolish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think in the definition of courage, that gets pretty close to it. I think I always, these days I use, and I, I've said it to many and I say it on our team at any question, I say, you know, 20 seconds of courage. 20 seconds of courage is, our, is, is the rule that I've lived by for the longest time. Whether that's dating girls or whatever it is, it's like take a deep breath, 20 seconds of courage. But it's not something that I ever... It's not a comfortable thing, is it? I mean, it is a vulnerability that you've got to be prepared to own and have. Yeah. And, you know, I like um, Mike Tyson has a quote, it's only delusional if it doesn't come true, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that, yes. I live in that space of delusion, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so I was speaking as if it had already happened mm. all the time. I was at least two years ahead and people thought I was nuts, so one thing I used to do, which could be helpful for people if they can allow themselves to break that mental, I call it the mental rule book, is some of the little tools that I did. 
first of all, I surround myself with my goals, put them all over the place. I even painted my ceiling with glow in the dark paint of splits in case I got up in the middle of the the night to, to go to the bathroom and I would see him. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was obsessed. I was obsessed the best kind. Mm -hmm. Now what I used to do was I didn't have time for in swimming. We have, you, you have the conditioning, you have the middle of the season, and then you ramp down for the taper, you know, this Mm kind of window where you really just allow yourself to explode with energy, be rested, all that sort of thing. And the timing is critical you shave down, all these different dynamics come into the final competition of this season and you drop seconds. It's a major difference between the middle of the season, right? So at the end of the season, you're kind of more or less stuck with the time, especially if it's not that great. Mm. I'm being foolish. (laughs) I'm being bold in my mind. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not, I, I can't sit around and wait for results. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back. I'm going to rewind the mental tape and I'm going to see, okay, if I got that start just right and I got that turn, all these turns just right, what would my time be? What would my base speed be? What would my time be? And I would come up with this new time. I would just completely remove all evidence of the actual time. And I lived in a state of delusion where I was like, this is my time. If you would have asked me at that time, I would have said, this is my time. Right. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really having to talk to anyone about that. This is my internal world. And what happens is you start to normalize that that time because it is a reality. I did really feel like I could, if everything played out perfectly in a perfect race, that I was that fast. Mm. Okay. Once you normalize that, the human, I, I would like to think the human condition is, okay, now I know that. How can I go that much faster? Right. So now I'm basing my next season's goals off of this new fabricated time, which has become my real time. And so I call it leapfrogging. Mm. So I was leapfrogging results because I, I just couldn't have a mediocre season. There wasn't enough time for it. Right. I always felt like it was Indiana Jones, you know, trying to outrun that, that boulder. That was my entire career. Mm. There's not enough time. Got to keep going. You know, and it created created this sense of urgency. Mm. And I had guys on the team that would say, you can't keep dropping two seconds every season. I'd turn to them and say, why not? I'm the one that makes that up, right? I'm the one that makes that rule up. And I was doing this sort of leveraging the mind all the time and did really have miraculous results becoming this state champion in four years from learning how to swim. Mm. And I continued to do that where I would just keep leveraging it, leveraging it. So I go to university and my freshman year, first meet, we're going against USC. They were very, back Mm. then they were really great swimming school. And there's eight swimmers and I swim my best time ever. So it's the time that would have won state the year before. And I get eighth out of eight. Mm. And I was like, oh, I love this. This is awesome. (laughs) I'm where I need to be. Mm. because I wanted to know what the rest of the world was doing. Mm. So see, I viewed everything as a process of learning, Mm. right? Kobe, I I like to use him as a template with, as an example. And he has a phrase that I always like to share, which is failure is an illusion. I just love that. And he would say, failure is an illusion. What is failure? You, You have a version of failure. I have a version of what might be failure. Yours is different than mine. So what is it? His idea was that I'm here to learn. And the only failure is if I fail on on Monday and I don't get up on Tuesday, that's failure to me, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But if I keep going, it never ends. Mm -hmm. And so that's the place that I was coming from. So when I got eighth, it was like winning, right? I was like, I'm in the right place. And if I find a way to beat these guys, I'm going to be one of the best. When when, when you're setting the goals and, and, and normalizing your dream, you know, and really, as you put it, leveraging your mind, which I really like that. How much of it is sort of optimism versus realism? You know, is it like you say each year you revisit those goals? And I kind of like that kind of a quote, you know, setting optimistic yet realistic goals. How is that pendulum moving between those two to set something that is well within your grasp, 
well, not well, it's on the extension. It's at the, <laughs> it's at the very end of your grasp, but knowing what that can be. I mean, it's, you know, is that something you've played around with and tried to figure out how to really optimize a goal or a dream that's out there and, and making it, you know, in biteable chunks like you did? Mm-hmm. Again, a great question. There has to be some level of realism, you mm. know, so like I base a lot of my work with people. The foundation is with goals, mm. you know, short term, midterm, long term, and even purpose beyond. What I like to do, the flow state, you got to be uncomfortable, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I like to say it's kind of like reaching for a glass when you're a little kid, reaching up to a cupboard that's out of your reach. But if everything goes right, you can you can get that glass. Like that's how uncomfortable we want to be. We want to be you know, kind of Mm. when I'm working with someone, it's like you're shifting around in the seat because now we're really close to this could happen and it's not unbelievable. But if it becomes unbelievable, then we don't take it serious. Right. right. So you are really kind of trying to feel it. And I try to feel it with the people that I'm working with because it has to be uncomfortable, but you also have to feel like, okay, this really could happen. And, And do you feel having this boldness and this ability to be vulnerable, Did that ever feel like it created a negative pressure on yourself? You know that, I guess these days we swap that to be the called anxiety, but did that ever feel like at times maybe you've put yourself out there too far and that it felt overwhelming? I dealt with that probably more after my sport. Mm. Yeah. So in swimming, at least we have a swimming pool. There's a lot of metrics that you can actually control. Mm -hmm. You're not left to a team. Um, performance, you know, you don't have judges, so you don't have the human element. It's more or less kind of a, you know, laboratory, let's say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so when I was done with swimming, that's where I really struggled. Mm. I really, you know, I started having extreme panic attacks and that's the, you know, mental health side of Mm -hmm. my, my journey. I started having all these panic attacks and I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and luckily I I was able to get into a UCLA program on repeat exposure. And it really was this, you know, baby steps process of journaling, coming to the group, pushing yourself into that uncomfortable space, what I like to call proving yourself wrong Mm. and doing it through little, little tiny, tiny micro doses, if you will. The control element, when you have a panic attack, I mean, this is my understanding for me and what helped me to, to eventually get through it was that you're trying to control something that's out of your control. So when you try to control life, you know, and you can't, <laughs> it just starts to spin more and more out of control. Mm-hmm. It's like you hit, you know, your car hits a patch of black ice and you white knuckle it and try to uh, steer your way through it. You're only going to make the car spin more. Mm. So you have to let go of the control And that's what I learned through panic attacks, Mm. you know, and repeat exposure. We we often said with sport, you know, it was the greatest place, you know, for my wife and I, we're both professional athletes. It was like a great place to learn a lot of life lessons, you know, through sport in in, in almost a a safe environment. But it doesn't always get you completely ready because there's a lot of uncontrollables out there. But I do want to rewind a little bit more and go back. You've had your first event you know, and, and you got to, you know, came eighth, um, you got to learn a lot. And, and you mentioned there, you know, the process of learning, which I really like that, you know, that, that idea of focusing on the process rather than the outcome. But as a, I guess you would have been about 18, 19 to fully comprehend and understand that at such a young age is, is a, a great tool that you, you had in your tool belt. For me at that point, you know, I stayed focused on the end goal. And so I eventually, in that you know, trajectory of the university four years, by the time I was a senior my fourth year, I became a two-time national champion, hmm. and I also went the fastest split ever recorded, hmm. right? And so for this, you know, the complete story, you know, the movie version, real life, when I did win the national trophy, 
the person that handed me the trophy was Pablo Morales, right? <laughs> the guy that I had put on my wall. Oh, I love so. that. That's so great. Yeah, that is the movie version, and I love when that go that actually does happen in real life. That's so great. Did you talk, yeah. did you tell him about it? Was that you got to share that? I, you know, in award ceremonies, you don't have a no, lot no, of time. No, no. But I'm tear. You know, I'm crying. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and I'm like, I, you know, Pablo, you have no idea what this means. Like, I, I like this is everything to me. Mm. That's about all I got out. Out with mm. all the tears. Mm. <laughs> That's fantastic. And then, I mean, you, you know, you've won the nationals Olympics, you know, that was, mm. that was the dream yeah. as a 14 year old. What, what happened next? Well, okay. Story, <laughs> the movie version. Um, okay. So I go to the Olympic trials in 92 and um, Pablo my buddy on the wall decides that he is going to do what's never been done before. And I don't think it's been done since he comes out of retirement and within one season, he shows up to Olympic trials. I'm racing against my idol and he wins the Olympic trials and I'm, I, he took the spot that I would have taken. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So I joke with people about that and say, you know, when you do put up, someone on your wall, make sure you keep them on the wall that they are retired. They stay retired. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's amazing how life and whatever you believe in has a sense of humor. It's like mm. this, you pray, you ask, you dream, you want to be bloody clear with what you, <laughs> with what you want, yes. right? You know, and be very, very clear and detailed about what that exactly looks like, feels like, tastes like, because Life has a sense of humor, right? I mean, I mean, I don't mm. mean to make light of what you know would have been devastating for you at the time, but it is yeah. life is crazy. It really is. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Well, it really puts you in a position, you know, because I really didn't. You don't know at the time. For me, it was all about making the Olympics. So here I was, you know, on my couch all summer long, you know, just going, I'm an alternate. So if anything happens to these two guys, then I'm going to get in. Yeah. And that's a, that's an interesting space to be in. Oh, I've been there, mate. I was, I was there for 2000 Olympics. So a quick little bit, sorry to bring it back to me real quick, but I have a similar feeling where I was ranked number two in the world. I'd won the Olympic, uh, the, the, the race the year before at the, at the Sydney world cup. It was like everything was dotted. I was, and then all of a sudden I was an alternate. That, that's a very short version of it. But just sort of sitting there right up until the race going, well, I'm kind of ready to race if someone drops out. Um, mm -hmm. but it is, it's kind of like, what am I kind of doing here? I'm kind of on the fringe. I'm not really in the team. I'm kind of over here. Um, it's a very awkward position. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you want to say that you don't wish injuries. <laughs> no, I know. But just may maybe just a, maybe just a calf strain, maybe just a little. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I know. It's it was, competitive to the bone. Oh, I know. Uh, I know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, mate. So that, that was definitely, I mean, that first version was actually pretty positive. Mm -hmm. I, I was like, man, Pablo, like, man, I'm racing against him. You know, it was exciting. It was, it was fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a hardship to it, but I didn't really know at the time because it was all pretty new and exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, once we go in about two years later, that's where I was kind of you know, Rowdy Gaines is one of the main announcers mm. and I was at nationals. Good with he said, he's actually been on the podcast recently. Yeah. Oh, yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. He yeah. is, he's great. Yeah. So he had kind of tapped me at the time and said, you know, this is the guy to watch in this event for the next Olympics. Yeah. And so it was a big moment. Like here I am, I'm coming, I'm going to do this. Um, you know, it's, it's my time. And again, your life, it becomes something that you could actually use to help others with, what I did is morning prelims went fine. We had prelims and finals mm -hmm. back then and went great. Number one, going into finals. I go back to the hotel and this is what I coach people on, being able to handle pressure because pressure is like a magnifying glass, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I really try mm -hmm. <laughs> to take people through, don't make any choices, right? Fall back into your habits and routines, just trust them. Hmm. I, at the time I didn't know anything about that. Cool. And so I go back to the hotel room and I had this just sort of random thought almost, well, you know, when my muscles are nice and warm, you know, that's when I do well. 
just a little tiny thought. Well, that gets magnified into this and, you know, and we're intense people, right? Um, <laughs> so it's like, okay, I'm going to put my sweats on. We have these like big parkas that you would wear out, you know, especially you could wear them in a snowstorm. So I put those on and then I get under my covers for my nap and everything completely, you know, covered. And then I wake up, I don't know, it was an hour or two later and I'm completely drenched in sweat. I don't even think anything of it. I'm like, oh, my muscles, you know, I'm good. Everything's fine. So I go into finals. And when I dive into finals, there's nothing. Just Uh, dead in the water. uh, I mean, I had completely dehydrated myself. (laughs) And I look at that and it's just really one of those pivotal moments because I didn't have anyone in my life like me to be able to process it. Because when I'm working with someone, you have to deal with a lot of adversity just in life, Mm -hmm. right? And when things get extreme like that and you don't take the time to be able to dig into it and go, okay, you know, it was just this and it was just that and Mm -hmm. go ahead and share, go ahead and cry. You know, everyone talks about mental toughness these days. It's a, it's Mm -hmm. a, you know, a phrase that's thrown around a lot. And I was going over it with, you know, some of these top, top uh, professional athletes that I work with. I mean, what's mental toughness to you? Am I, you know, because you appear to be tough. And they say, well, you know, a lot of it's actually come from talking with you and uh, you allowing me to cry, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's an interesting space to be in, to be that, have that space to be vulnerable. Mm. I didn't have that, right? I didn't have anyone. I had coaches, they were awesome, but I didn't have anyone on the side to be able to take the time to have this. And I didn't even know that I needed this conversation. Mm. So I pushed on through because at least in swimming, and I would say most sports, they're year round. So I fell on my face and then I just was like, man, you know, I knew in the back of my head, if I could just take a sabbatical for a minute, right? Like for a month, I could collect myself. I could regain my strength. I could take away, you know, work through this. I didn't, it was like, you don't want to lose, you know, the momentum and everybody else is going to be at the next nationals and, you know, all this. So you keep pushing forward and I lost my drive in that event. Mm. I just did. I, it hurt. It was painful. It was like, and I never went into that space to rebuild it. And so I was burned, you know, from that. And what I did go into the next Olympic trials, I make it into finals. I'm in the mix. I'm not really that passionate about that same sport, you know, that Mm. same event. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just weird to think back because your life just happens so fast sometimes. And you're at the Olympic trials, like this is it, possibly the last Olympic trials of your entire life. And you're just kind of going through the motions and you don't even realize you're going through the motions, mm. right? And so what ends up happening, I get kind of a mediocre, you know, fi- final performance, didn't make the team in the event. But then I had this event, the last event, it's for swimming, it is the 100-yard dash. Mm-hmm. It's the, you know, this 100-yard dash of swimming. It's the 50-meter free back then. The fastest man in the pool, fastest man on the planet kind of thing. Yeah. And so it's just fun, right? I just was having fun. And that's when all of a sudden I qualified for finals, an event that I didn't really expect to get into finals. Got into finals. My coach is just like, hey, you never know. You never know just go have fun, just having fun. And that's what I try to invigorate people with, with is the joy. Joy is such a key component to Mm -hmm. performance Mm -hmm. and being able to handle pressure. And and at that point, I didn't really have any pressure. It was just, let's just go have fun. Who knows what's going to happen? Well, I went a time that put me fourth in the world. It, It was crazy. Like all of a sudden I was up there, but I was also the fourth fastest American. Right. (laughs) And so again, I had done every, I'm I'm hundreds of a second away from being an Olympian. I have to watch someone else go get the title of Olympian. And you can't even see with the, you you know, with the naked eye, you can't see the difference between our performance. Yeah. Right. It's brutal when you're coming from a country, a big successful country like the US to make Olympic teams, especially a swim team in the US, is just off the chart. Australia's a bit the same. You make an Australian swim team, it's like, 
it's off the chart, right? I mean, to make a finals of any of these of any of these events. Um, so I know what you're talking about. Even my wife Laura, you know, she made the Olympic finals for swimming at the hundred fly back in about when you were probably swimming ninety six for the ninety six games. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But then ended up becoming Olympic triathlete. She kind of <laughs> moved out of the swimming world, but also you know, in the world of triathlon, especially for the women, the women triathletes are always brutal. And, and Laura always says, you know, the year she missed out on the Olympics in 04, she came third at the world championships four months before to make the Olymp- U S Olympic team, you had to win the world championships and she got third. Mm. And so it's mm. kind of like that kind of a mindset, <laughs> it, you know, it, it happened. There's a lot of stories like that where, you're missing some of the greatest athletes in the world at the Olympics, you know, but Mm -hmm. you get to Mm -hmm. see them at the world championships a bit more because they're often a bit more depth from the stronger countries. But when you go to the Olympics, quite often you're better off coming from a very small country where you haven't had to go through the rigmarole of such brutal trials, you know? Mm. I'm probably probably going to get a lot of people writing me saying, you don't know what you're talking about, Greg, but I have seen it firsthand. That's why I'm coming from Mm -hmm. experience Mm -hmm. um, that when you're in these big countries, it's brutal. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the reality of that situation was I could have gone to any other country, you know, come from (laughs) any other country in the world. Yeah. And I not only would have gone to the Olympics, but I would have been an Olympic medal hopeful. Yeah. You've been right right there. Absolutely. (laughs) You're in the final and and you, you, 0.1 0.1 of a second off a medal. It's like, yeah, I know. Look, I feel your pain. Uh, I've been through it both <laughs> myself and, and Laura. We went through all of that. And But, you know, coming out of that, and, and this leads us to where you are now, is you've been able to experience these yeah. moments in time that now you can actually help others. And the joy, as you described it earlier, the joy of helping other people optimize themselves and, and help them reach their potential I don't know. There's something vastly superior helping others do achieve their dreams almost than your own. I don't know how you feel, but that's quite often how I felt. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I look at all these different, if you will, models of performance or helping people. I've always been fascinated ever since I was a little kid. And one organization, Alcoholics Anonymous, AA, Mm. and what they do is that you have to be able to, you know, basically have gone through the experience Mm -hmm. to be able to help others. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been really key to, to my journey is to be able to, you know, like I like to say, I heal myself, right. Those are still wounds, if you will, Mm -hmm. that will never go away. I I, I guess, you know, Uh, it would make sense. They're part of you. Yeah. And I accept that. Mm. And I help heal myself by helping others Mm -hmm. heal themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's that process of, it's a circle. It keeps coming back. It's really, really vital, but also it's a, it's a curiosity, right? So that you're always like hungry. I know Pete Carroll, you know, Super Bowl Mm -hmm. coach of the Seahawks, that he was a player and he would have made it into the NFL, but there was a strike at the time. That was his window of opportunity. And when he goes in and he talks to his teams now, he says, make the most of this moment because I didn't get this moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I get emotional about that because it's personal experience. Like it's sacred. It's a sacred space. As I like to say, it's a battlefield out there. You know, the bullets are flying. I'm a warrior. I can help people get ready for war on the athletic battlefield. And there's an extreme pressure that happens out there that unless you've been there, you don't know. You can't read about it. No, it's so true. You can watch movies. (laughs) You're not going to get it until you're out there. You need to have that emotional feeling, that very deep emotional feeling that's not controllable almost, you know, it's like this and there's a grieving that goes with it. You know, you have this grief of when you you were so certain something was going to happen, you've dreamed big, you've believed it, you've believed it, you've managed your mind like you did for, for many, many years. And to some degree, it can be ripped from under you at that last minute. And, it, and it's brutal. And there's a real grief that goes with that. You know, you talk about helping people. Do you have kind of a, a method that you work through when you say you get a new client, whether it's an executive or athlete, or is it just you work with people and you see where they're at and, you know, it's kind of a little bit, let's work together and just, or is it a step-by-step program that you work through? It's a combination. Mm. Uh, you know, like my, my coach, I've been, when I got to the top at the university level, I had incredible coaches and I remember 
they, they said to me, good coaching is more like an art rather than a science. Mm. So that's what I try to do is, is to be open and be able to be there, right? Like, we, you know, we've talked about, you know, both of us have children and the school that my kids go to, it's designed in a way where it's exploratory, where the kids, rather than the kids have to go to school, it's the principle that the school comes to them, mm. the metaphor of it, so that every child has a light inside that's unique and authentic. So that to me is my approach is that I want to find out what's authentic about you because that's going to be your strength when you're out there competing Mm -hmm. is that authenticity and for you to own it. Right. Mm -hmm. And know that no one else out there is like you. And if you can get that clear, I mean, watch out, that's, that's a level of confidence, you know, and that's kind of what we're looking for is that X factor is, is the confident part of the the equation. Mm. So I'll go in and I do like goals, but if someone, you jump in with people wherever they're at. So if someone's already in competitions, I will probably back away from goals because that's a little bit more of a trajectory kind of, Mm -hmm. you know, landscape and mapping that out. And I'll go straight into, okay, you're going out into battle right now. I'm going to take you through pressure how to deal with pressure, right? So when I tell the story of my self-sabotage of that, that race in between, you know, the two Olympics, Mm -hmm. that's key for me to to say, if you don't deal with pressure, you will make a choice possibly that will change everything. And we have to be ready to look at pressure and be able to handle things so that you're clear under pressure. Mm -hmm. Again, it goes back from this personal experience. So when someone tells me something that they're going through, I will go inward first, right? I'm not going up to my head. I'm going inward and I'm feeling what's going on. And then I allow that to inspire me like, okay, if I was in their position, what would be helpful? And then also I've always been kind of open, you know, I got my degree in psychology, so I'm open to, you know, I've always been curious about all these different ways that people, you know, different personality types. Mm. I work with an LPGA, you know, she's, she's a a star. And the last season it was all about winning. And then this season she comes to me and says, okay, I have two rules for us. We can't talk about winning and I don't want to hear about other success stories. (laughs) I mean, I just tie my hands by my, behind my back, <laughs> but okay. You know, I love that. Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. And we found a way and I understood what she was saying because she was getting to understand who she was exactly. through the process. And she realized like, Oh, when you tell me success stories, I know it means something to you because you're kind of giving me validation that this works and you know, all that. But what that does with my personality type is it actually makes me compare myself to them. And if I'm not getting their results, then I feel bad about myself. It's a competitive, like, oh, it's a competitive that. nature. That was one of my favorite things I often come back to in this show with that hints of core model. And I think, you know, the hints of core model I'm talking about where it's, you know, they ask the, the three questions. Do you know who you are? Do you know what you want? And are you in control of your own life? And when you know who you are, and that takes time and and it's always evolving and it's changing. Just who I was yesterday is different probably today, you know, and it's like this constant it's this constant bar that just keeps changing. But I would be exactly like your LPGA golfer <laughs> where I'm like, mm. I don't need that. And I'm somebody, maybe it's because of my insecure, you know, ways of my teenage years, but I'm somebody that enjoys the pats on the back. I'm not mm-hmm. somebody that likes, I don't, I'm not, don't give me a whip. You know, I'm not that person. Don't tell me what to do, but just give me a little encouragement every now and then. And I'll give you, I'll give you everything I got. And, and these, once you know your personality strengths, it's amazing how you can grow them and grow yourself and work with other people. Um, but I think that's great. I love that little story. that She's like, mm. I'm too competitive to hear that other people are successful. <laughs> I like mm. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I like to look at like, let's say horse racing, thoroughbred horse racing. Mm. And you take these very expensive horses and they're getting ready for their big race. And every horse is different. So some need blinders because they need to stay in their lane, stay focused, they get distracted. (laughs) And then others like to compete. Mm -hmm. So the blinders are actually the worst thing you can do. Mm -hmm. They're both top caliber horses, 
but they're completely different in their performance. Mm-hmm. And you have to be open to that. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a process of discovery because, you know, we did try the other way, you know, for a season and it was somewhat successful, but then it was like, well, let's try, you know, taking it up. Let's uh, customize it a bit. I had to be open to that and actually embrace that and go, okay, I like the challenge. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I think that we can do this. Mm -hmm. And so we, we moved into more of the flow state, you know, working on, okay, what are the elements of getting, you know, the big wave? How are we going to surf this? How are we going to get into the moment? So, cause that's what I like to work on with people. That's one of the, the, I would say one of the main areas is that, you know, you're at your best. This is what I I love. If I can be a little bit spiritual, religious, or whatever you want to call it, Mm. you know, the flow state to me is, is sports enlightenment. I'm going to (laughs) really, people are open-minded to that where you are at your best when it has everything to do with you and nothing to do with you simultaneously. I'm always studying greatness. I feel like greatness, there's a blueprint out there. And I love to study people that have come before and then people that are current. Mm. And that's what I've seen is their best performances are when they get into the flow, when they get into the moment, into the zone. And it's not about them anymore. They're being. And that's what I think it's protected. How do you help these people reach that state of flow? Are there steps Or is it taking it, like you said, every person's unique and what buttons you have to push to try and find that flow state? You know, what is the process? Because if I'd love to help into a state of flow all the time, but I find it quite difficult. Um, But Uh I've been there and I've had those moments where you're running at top speed and all of a sudden you're like, wow, 6K went by and I just, what happened? I just, I feel fantastic, you know? How can you get Uh there? Well, okay, so... I think this is where me competing at a, at a high level has been really helpful because when I'm working with someone, I get the buy-in, the trust pretty quickly because I'm speaking from some experience. Mm-hmm. The part of that I find is interesting because it's kind of a paradox is that I'm really encouraging people to be uncomfortable. I'm really wanting them to lean into failure. That we're just processing data and your greatest growth is going to happen when you are failing, you, you know, and, and a weakness can become a strength. So I'm really encouraging that. And what's interesting about the flow state is that you have to be uncomfortable to get into the state of bliss. And so when I am working with someone, I really am trying to get them, you know, I like to use metaphors because brain's wired for story. I say, okay, the people that really get into the flow state consistently are these big wave surfers, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I like the metaphor of a wave anyways. They're like dropping, you know, if you, so you're, you're from Australia, so you, you grew up around the water. So when you get up to a certain level, uh, you know, height of a, a wave, you're dropping in. Mm-hmm. When mm-hmm. these guys are getting up to these, like even I think there's a hundred foot wave now oh, that they, they're surfing now. now. Naz- yeah. Nazareth in Portugal there is insane, isn't it? Oh my God. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the, what they're doing is they're dropping in. And so I like to keep things really simple because I know when you go out to the battlefield, it's got to be simple. Otherwise under pressure, the mind just scatters. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and so what I work on is three elements. One is, and I think of a tripod, right? Three legs to the tripod. First element is control. So you have to be able to do the task, the task that is asked. Mm -hmm. So that surfer has to be a really good surfer. Mm -hmm. And otherwise this is suicide, right? That's not going (laughs) to, this is not going to end well. (laughs) The second element is unpredictable. And that's most sports, and especially when you're surfing a wave, every wave is unique. Mm. They may know the direction, general direction, it's going to break, but every wave's different. Mm. So that's kind of built into it. Now, the third area is where I spend most of the time working with people, and I've said it throughout this, that it's about pressure, that pressure is necessary. And so, you, you know, you need that tension to get your attention. So again, with that big wave surfer, he's dropping into the wave, knows how to surf, doesn't know exactly what's going to happen with this wave. If he makes a mistake, he not only could hurt himself really bad, but he could die. Mm. So it brings him to a level of immediacy where all of a sudden there's this level of clarity where it's almost like 
you become both the participant and also the observer mm. simultaneously, mm-hmm. right? I kind of think of the scene in The Matrix <laughs> where, you know, Keanu Reeves, the bullets, we'd never seen that back, then, you know, yeah. like the bullets are flying at him and he's leaning back and then the camera is able to pan around. Like that's what it looks like, right? If you were to take a movie image of being able to participate, but also be able to be the observer and navigate those bullets, right? Mm. And so that's what happens. To me, everything, you know, has to come back to something that's extremely practical. Otherwise, I'm not going to remember it anyway. So to me, the flow state makes sense. It's just a very simple Yes, that equation works. <laughs> I like that equation. I, I'm not sure I love the fact that I have to be death is the consequence, but I, no, I'm not just saying <laughs> that. But, but it's almost like it needs to be that amount of pressure to force that activation of the mind to almost find that state. You know, it does help because it's if you don't, you die. I mean, that's an extreme version, but it's mm-hmm. there's something very real about that that I think everybody listening can get their head around going, yeah. I could I can picture myself having to really that out of body experience to have to guide myself through that pressure. Otherwise I'm gonna yeah. die. And you're right, those yeah. those big wave surfers. That's a great I love that. I love the um the metaphor of the, the big wave surfer because I think we can all get our head around that. When you sit down with say say a movie producer, mm-hmm. it's the same kind of work as working with an athlete. You 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 take this, you know, it's this kind of ability to find flow states. It's you know, is it the same kind of work or is it different? Well, uh, you know, I, I went into it going, okay, they had heard a Formula One podcast that I'd been on. Um, for Formula One racing, I had two people contact me off of that. One was a sales executive in Norway who had just started. I didn't know it at the time. He didn't tell me what company, but it turned out that it was the fastest growing tech company in Europe. Mm. Okay. But he's entry level sales. And then also I had a Netflix film director and they said, we really enjoyed listening to the podcast and just curious uh, would you, in they, these separate conversations, of course, but they, they were saying, you know, basically, would you coach us like you would coach the athletes and coaches that you work with? Mm. I said, sure, let's do it. Basically looking for a metric, right. That, that really works well within their space. I'm not going to teach this person how to do anything in sales. I'm not going to teach the Netflix director how to direct a film, mm. but what I can do is teach them about the flow state. I can teach him about pressure. So with the Netflix film director, it was awesome because first of all, he was all in, loved sports as the metaphor because it's a great example. It's a meritocracy, right? That's what we kind of love about sports is that you earn whatever it is in sports. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Like that's it. You either score or you don't score. You either get that time or you don't get that time. Mm. And so I come you know, I send people out into, if you will, the battlefield, they come back with results. We immediately process it. I feel the immediacy that their life's on the risk. Uh, you know, like I get into the flow state too. <laughs> when I coach, I'm never comfortable, mm. right? I don't want to be comfortable because mm. I want to surf too. And so I feel a sense of immediacy that they're coming to me. They trust me. I have to deliver because they're going out to battle and then they're going to come back with results and then it's going to be win, lose or whatever it might be, but it's going to be pretty black and white and we're going to keep working on this, working on this. And so to me, it made perfect sense that I could teach other people this and I'm not actually, I'm not teaching a basketball player, football player, or a soccer player or any of these people how to do their sport, right? I'm teaching them how to go through the metrics of whether it's their training mindset or it's their performance mindset, we're working through, you know, how to navigate their space, their life, their Mm -hmm. activity. And so with a Netflix film director, what really was huge for him was to understand pressure. And he was like, all of a sudden, everything shifted. It was interesting because when he started, he was starting production on this film. It was probably two years ago. And he he was going into pre-production and he would have these meetings with Netflix and the first meeting, um, he came back to me and he said it didn't go very well. And it didn't go well at all. And I was going, okay, results. That's it. processing data. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I take him through the training on pressure. He was like, great. Love it. This makes perfect sense. He goes back into the next meeting and he comes back and he says, they love it. They're on board. All systems go. 
Now, what had happened is all of a sudden he, he had been playing it safe the first meeting. The second meeting, he was all in like, I got to surf my own wave. And so he went all in with, this is the way I would do it. This is the way I, I want to, you know, boom, 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 <laughs> leaning into possible failure. And they said, that's exactly why we, we want to work with you. That's awesome. Fast forward, <laughs> true story, fast forward. And, he's, and, and I would coach him when he was on the set. I, I coached him in post-production. And recently they released the film, uh, I want to say two or three weeks ago, and it's number two in the world, right? Wow. Like, oh, congrats. And, That's and awesome. I never, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't coach him on doing directing or post or any of that stuff. No, no. So that's art, right? That's the art world. Yeah. So let's move back over to the business world with the sales. And so with the sales uh, executive, it was same thing. I said, okay, what I want to do with you is I want to find a metric that you will do, a rep that you will do, and you will commit to that rep, right? And it's going to be small. It's going to be too, it's going to seem like it's too small. And I said, what could you commit? Could you call, let's say 30 minutes a day, you call new people. I'm focused on you controlling your controllables. If you get rejection, fine, that's failure. We'll process that information. But what I'm really interested in is that you pick up that phone for 30 minutes a day and you make the attempt. I don't care what they say. All I care about is you picking up the phone. Mm -hmm. That's what we can, can, can control. <laughs> so he's like, great, I love it. That's what I'm going to do. Because in sales, just like in the arts, people take things personal. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, the feedback loop slows down when we start to put feelings in that feedback loop, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We just got to process the data. He starts doing this 30 minutes. So on the first day, you know, to be dramatic, I said, okay, you could just go to your office, 30 minutes, get on the phone and just plant seeds, go home 30 minutes the first day. Next day, I want you to go do 30 minutes. That's your commitment with me. That's all I really care about. And then you're going to also have some follow-up, right? Some people are going to start to call you back. Okay. Next day might be an hour, two hours. Third day, 30 minutes. That's our agreement. And then you're going to have some follow-up, probably second generation conversation by then, you know, let's say, simplifying it. And, you know, by the end of the week, you're going to have a full day possibly. And so he just does that. And he goes from the bottom of sales, right? He was dead last all the way to the top, he, he is not, a, not only top, the top, but also he doubles second place mm. just from that simple metric. It's almost like just keep turning up. My, my example of that is kind of with this podcast, a bit like in the sales story that you were just sharing was I committed, I was going to do a hundred episodes. That's the goal. Okay. Mm -hmm. One every week. Um, I'm going to get some criticism. I'm going to get, you know, feedback. And I love the feedback and criticism because it helps me get better. And I take it on board. And when I first got that criticism and some of it was, it was actually kind of hurt. Now mm -hmm. I get it, you know, 130, 140 episodes in. I'm like, okay, I can work on that, but it doesn't affect me as much because I'm further along because I've just kept turning up and turning up and I've allowed myself to be vulnerable, which is not an easy thing. And I know that a lot of people mm. aren't doing that. So I feel good about myself by the fact that I've been able to do that. And it, it kind of, I think the more you just keep turning up, the more you keep doing and controlling what you can control, as you put it, it's amazing how you build up this resilience, you know, and, mm -hmm. and even if there's negative feedback and it can be useful sometimes, but even if it's not useful, you kind of go, okay. Well, you're not the one doing it either, are you? Here am I giving, mm -hmm. giving it a great go of myself. But I, my point is in telling you all of that is it really is about just setting your goal long term, turn up, just keep turning up. You don't have to be the best every day, but you do have to keep turning up every day. And that can be the biggest differentiator. And I've noticed that big time with the podcast because the podcast is more of an art than a science. You know, it's one of those, uh -huh. I come from sport where that was one thing. And now this is my art and it's my creative side. And that's a... Uh -huh. That's a far, that's a stretch for me. And, and so it's been a real work in progress, but having that athletic mindset, you know, that winner's mindset where you just kind of just go, no, I'm just going to 
I'm going to outlast you and outdo you and I will improve. Mm -hmm. And that's been the rewarding part of doing this podcast. And I I get it when you work with business people now in the sales or if you're working with movie directors, it crosses across the board, you know, this this mindset and and the power of the mind. I just think it's fantastic what you're doing. To talk a little bit about what you just, you know, like I have this phrase that I say, baby steps to a quantum leap. Right. Mm-hmm. So someone might ask, what are you, performance coach, mental performance coach? I would say I'm an action coach, right? Because mm-hmm. if we just work on the mind and it doesn't turn into action, you're not going, <laughs> nothing's going anywhere, right? <laughs> you're living in your dream. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And so the baby steps to a quantum leap. When I start with someone, I'll go through the goals and then I want to know, okay, you achieved that goal. How are you going to feel? I'd say nine times out of 10, They'll say, well, I'll feel confident. I said, okay, well, let's work on confidence first um, before the goal. Start at the end. I like It'll that. get us closer. Yeah, yeah. And so I go, well, where's confidence going to come from, right? And they have this idea, like usually it's, it's this idea, I'm either born confident or I got to work on being confident. That's the target is confidence. I'll back them up and say, your confidence comes from little tiny things that you do every day that you actually do right? That's, that's the action. That's the baby step. That's the metric that we focus on every day. You keep showing up on that metric. Then what ends up happening is that you start to get momentum and it's like a train. It just builds up speed and it gets going and going and going. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you are really close to that goal or you've achieved that goal, but you're definitely confident. And you don't even realize you're confident. And I've seen this transformation with these people that I work with where they're literally a different person. Like they are different. And I said, when you get to that state of confidence, you will, one third of the equation, let's say, is that you will achieve that goal or be close to that goal. But the part that's going to be interesting for you and even for me is that like, like there's two thirds of stuff that's going to happen in your world because you become a magnet for opportunity because now you're confident, right? People love confidence. So you're going to have things that are going to be handed to you or you're going to get an opportunity from left and right and who knows where. We don't even know where that's going to come from, but we want to get you in the state, you know, the space of confidence. And before you know it, you do have the number one podcast in the world, right? Mm -hmm. But it's that little tiny metric just keep doing that little tiny metric. I love that. For me personally, it, it really hit a chord because it's kind of feel like what I've been going through. So I really appreciate you you going through all that. But I want to thank you so much for just coming on and sharing all your knowledge. I feel like this is going to be the first of several. I don't know how you feel, but I've really enjoyed this. And you know, there's a lot more in my notes here that I want to cover, but I think we're going to have to probably call it for the moment um, until you come back on the show. How does that sound? I would love to. I would love to. I feel like we could talk for a month. Uh, uh, we could easily, <laughs> Seth, honestly. And I'd even love to say that the next time we do this, we do get to do it in person. Um, yes. It's a real joy when I get to have sit across from somebody and, and, and really have a conversation. It's a joy either way, though, to just have this opportunity to, to speak with you, to learn, to grow grow. Um, I feel very fortunate and blessed. So thank you so much for coming on, mate. Uh, it's, the pleasure is all mine. I, I just, I've enjoyed listening to your podcasts. Uh, I just love your process because, you know, like I, I, I feel like there's a frequency of greatness, right? A frequency when I say you tune into it, it's like a radio channel. And, you know, when we talk about Kobe, his whole trajectory was self-made if you really go and study it. But what he did was he made the pivot that I believe you're doing the pivot as well, or you've done the pivot for a while. And within three years of his retirement, he became an Oscar winner in, mm. in the arts. So this transfers across and greatness is a pattern. And I see what you're doing. And so I would encourage, I've enjoyed going back through the other podcasts that you have. They're just incredible I mean, because you're, you're present and you're curious And, you know, that environment brings out these conversations that people can walk away with tools that they can actually use Mm. right away. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I appreciate that very much, Seth. It really means the world to me that you, you say that. As I mentioned earlier, I don't mind the pats on the back, um, so I'll take it and I appreciate <laughs> it um, and I'll run with it and I'm not going to question it because I, it really does make <laughs> me feel good. So, mate, but thank you so much for you know coming on and, and sharing your journey and just so much of your knowledge. It, it, it truly means the world. And thank you, everyone, for listening and, and sharing the show and all your feedback. You, know, you can find all the show notes and timestamps and coupon codes at bennettendurance.com forward slash media. Thank you. Thanks a lot for listening. If you enjoyed the show, your support would truly be appreciated. You can visit the Patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice. Don't miss the next episode, so subscribe and be notified. For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit bennettendurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time, and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.